Okay, this lab has to do with spectroscopy and radioactivity. So it's a uh, two-part lab. Okay, so let's get this going. So spectroscopy, spectroscopy. Okay, that's pretty unreadable. And radioactivity. Okay, so we're going to do two parts. Okay, we're going to start with spectroscopy. Spectrum, this refers to color. Okay, so we're going to talk about colors. Okay, spectroscopy is going to be the study of colors. Okay, so... Uh, if you remember, when we spoke about, say, a charged particle, let's just say a proton. Okay, so I'll put a little plus there. Make believe this is a proton. And we know that the electric force field comes out, emanates, right, comes out of. We say this is a source of electric field. Doesn't matter. I could choose a negative charge. It doesn't matter what I choose, okay? Now, if we just look at it as it is, right, we say this is static. Nothing's happening, right? These lines go out to infinity, if infinity existed, okay? And what we're going to do now is we're going to wiggle or oscillate this charge, okay? I say wiggle a lot, but you can use oscillate, okay? We're going to wiggle the charge, okay? And when we wiggle the charge, that means that the electric field, the electric field will also wiggle, will also wiggle or oscillate will also wiggle. Okay. So what are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this charge, this charge, and we're going to wiggle it up and down, say. So I'm going to take this charge and I'm going to wiggle it up and down, up and down. Okay. Now, if I take one of these lines, one of these field lines, we're going to get this wiggling electric field. I'll call it WEF, wiggling. Yeah, again, you can use oscillating, okay? So the line of the electric field would have been straight, right? Just coming out. This one, one ray would be emanating straight out. But if I wiggle this up and down, what happens is the electric field starts to wiggle. Does it doesn't I'm wiggling it crazy, okay? There's my wiggling. So this is a wiggling electric field. Okay. And I think of this, this way I think of it, like a jump rope, right? When you take a jump rope and you wiggle it, like a jump rope. It's not really a jump rope, but I think of it as a jump rope. Okay. It's good for me to imagine that. Okay. Now notice it's supposed to be smooth. This guy's a little weird, but that's okay. So now when I wiggle it, notice I get these peaks like this or these valleys. Okay. Now at these points, all right. Um, these kinks, I call them kinks. These are kinks, right? They're kinks in the electric field. These kinks in the electric field actually are wiggling magnetic fields. So I'm going to draw something like this. Wee, 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 something like this. This thing now becomes a wiggling, W, magnetic field. Okay, so the kinks in the wiggling electric field, again, you could say oscillating, produce wiggling magnetic fields. Okay, so let's go up. Let's do this again. Okay, so I'm going to, okay, so let's take this charge. Here is my charge. Again, I'm going to wiggle it up and down, right? I'm going to try to be a little neater, but it's not, not easy. Okay, so there's my... A little better, right? There's my uh, wiggling... There's our wiggling electric field, okay? Oscillating electric field. But we said when these kinks appear, what we end up with at those points are... Oopsie. 
So this is our wiggling magnetic field. But notice that there's kinks in the wiggling magnetic field. <gasps> See, if you wiggle it, you also get kinks. Okay, and now I'm going to tell you that kinks in the wiggling magnetic field, in the wiggling, oscillating magnetic field, produce wiggling electric fields. So here on these kinks, now I draw another wiggling sign. Wee, wee. And this now is a wiggling electric field. And so if we put all this wiggling nonsense together, what we're saying is if you take an electric field and you wiggle it, there's my wiggling electric field. But that produces a wiggling magnetic field. But a wiggling magnetic field produces a wiggling electric field. But a wiggling electric field produces a wiggling magnetic field. But a wig, you get the idea, it just keeps going. So together, when you take an oscillating or wiggling electric field, and that's coupled together with a wiggling magnetic field, together, this is called, because there's an electric field and there's a magnetic field, this is called electromagnetic Oh, one word, I just spaced it out. Magnetic radiation. So what is electromagnetic radiation? It's wiggling electric fields and wiggling magnetic fields, radiation. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this for a couple minutes. Okay. So electromagnetic radiation, we just write as EM, electromagnetic radiation. Now, this stuff, the electromagnetic radiation, behaves like a wave. So I'm going to tell you a couple things about waves, simple things about waves, okay? And here's where we get some math, but it's a very easy math equation, okay? So electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation behaves like a wave. So I'm going to tell you some properties of wave. Well, not properties. I'm just going to tell you an equation for waves. Behaves like a wave. What kind of wave? Well, you know, you have water waves and waves on a rope, all different types of waves. Okay, so if I tried to draw really, I'll try to be neat now. There's my wave, wee, up and down. Oopsie, wee, I'm trying to be even, wee, up and down. Ah, uh, there we go. Oh, it's not too bad. Okay, up and down. Yeah, I'm just going to stop there, okay? Now I'm going to call certain points. I'll call this A, just to show you something that could be on the uh, exam or the T's exam. I'll call this C. I'll call this D. I'll call this uh, E. Call down here F. I'll call this G. All right, I'll stop there. There's a couple of things that... that characterize a wave, all right? The first thing we're going to talk about is the wavelength. So like it sounds, wavelength is a length. Okay? It could be centimeters, meters, nanometers, kilometers, miles, inches, any kind of length, because it's a length, okay? And it's usually symbolized by this symbol. This is called lambda. It's the Greek letter lambda, okay? So wavelength is going to be lambda. And what is the wavelength? The wavelength is the shortest repeated distance. And I will show you on this picture. Shortest repeated distance. I'll explain my terrible language here. What do I mean the so shortest repeated. Well, let's look at B for a second. B is on top of this crest. Oh, let, let me draw a line right through the middle. May I draw, draw? I'm going to put a dot line, right? So this is supposed to be right in the middle. So it's as much on top as it is on the bottom. Okay. Before I define wavelength, let me define the height. See that? From there to there. Should be the same 
as this height from the bottom to the middle, okay? And this is called the amplitude. So amplitude, I'm gonna write this on the side, amplitude is the height of the wave from the middle. Height of wave. Okay, that's a good word to know, the amplitude. If I go from the bottom to the top, then that's two times the amplitude. So the amplitude is from the, the middle to the top or the middle to the bottom because it's exactly the same. That line is through everything, okay? And that's called the amplitude of the wave. Now, the wavelength, if I show you here, if I started B at the top, the next time the wave's at the top would be D. So this distance from B to D would be lambda. So I'll just put it here. B, D, that's a D. D is equal to lambda. That just, that's a D. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay. If I go B to G, I think you can see that that's two wavelengths, right? If I go from C to F, well, that's a wavelength, right? A to C is a is lambda. You see that? What if I go A to D? What is that equal to? Well, that's the bottom here. A, right? Because this is supposed to come like this, right? So that's at the bottom. And here's the bottom C. So AC is lambda. This distance from A to C is lambda. And then to D, would be another half a lambda. So it's one and a half lambdas, one and one half lambda, right? Or three halves lambda, et cetera, okay? So if the uh, tease gives you a question like this or some diagram with this with letters, you can figure out what's the wavelength or two wavelengths or one and a half wavelengths, okay? It's not, not that big a deal. Okay, the other uh, thing that characterizes a wave is the frequency, okay? Okay. So let's write frequency here. Well, frequency just has a symbol F. That's easy, frequency. Okay, that's going to be defined by F, okay? And that's just going to be the number of wiggles per second or number of oscillations, number of wiggles or oscillations per second. Now notice, seconds is time. Right? There's a time in the denominator. Number of wiggles is just a number. It's just a number. So there's no units. So we can write this as the units of frequency. The units of frequency would be one over seconds. Right? That's just, and this thing is called a Hertz. After Heinrich Hertz. So a 60 Hertz, and that's shortened with the HZ, a 60 Hertz wave means it vibrates, wiggles 60 times per second. Okay. So now we have the frequency F and we have the wavelength lambda. Now the speed of a wave, and this holds for a water wave, a sound wave, electromagnetic wave, the speed of a wave is given by a very simple relation. Okay. The speed, V, or velocity, we say speed, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Notice the wavelength, say, is meters. Frequency is a one over second, so you get meters per second. So this is the speed of a wave. Very, very important. Very important. Okay? Again, it's a very simple equation. Usually, you know two things, you solve for the third. Now, especially, this is for all wave of all waves, okay? Water waves, sound waves, every kind of wave, okay? Now, there's the same relationship for electromagnetic radiation, but electromagnetic radiation is a crazy thing, no radiation. I'll put all, because we're going to talk about different parts, all electromagnetic radiation moves at the same speed. Same speed. And this speed is a constant. 
I'm going to write that very big constant. What is a constant? It means it never changes. Okay. When you're in a whatever medium, if you're in air, it never changes. If you're in glass, it never changes. If you're in a vacuum, it never changes. So it's a constant. Okay. And we call this constant little c. And little c, this stands for constant, is called the speed of light. And the speed of light has this number, okay? We'll be using it so much, but again, I don't ask you to memorize these constants. I would give it on an exam, okay? But it's given by this, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. If we convert that into, you know, units we use in, in, in the United States, this would be equivalent to about 186,000 miles. Per second. So if you shoot a, uh, you know, if you if you turn on a, a flashlight, in one second, the light that doesn't get bounced back, the light is one hundred eighty six thousand miles away. In five or six seconds, that light is a million miles away. So when we look at the sun, it takes light coming from the sun about eight to nine minutes, because the sun is ninety three million miles away. 93 oh, 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 miles away. So when you look at the sun, you're looking back in time eight minutes. And when you look at the stars, some of the stars, it took light a thousand years to get here. So you're looking back in time by a thousand years or a million years or a galaxy a billion years. Okay. Okay. Now we have a relation then for electromagnetic radiation. So for EM radiation, EM radiation, we have this result. Instead of V, we're going to use C equals F lambda. Okay. Remember, this is a constant. That means the frequency times the wavelength is a constant. Right? What kind of relationship is that? Well, if you remember Boyle's law, right? This is an inverse relation. Okay? That means if F, the frequency is big, lambda must be small. And if F is small, then Lambda must be big. It's an inverse relation. And you always, this always, always, always has to be equal to F times lambda for electromagnetic radiation always has to be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay? So this is always true for electromagnetic radiation. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to write the electromagnetic spectrum. I love this. I put a lot of questions on this, so beware. Okay. And what we do is we start, I'll start I'll write the spectrum like this, a little spastic, but that's okay. I'm sorry. A little, not that neat. Okay. On the left side, I'm going to put small frequency. And here I'm going to put large Lambda, large wavelength. And as we go across, as we go this way, we're going to increase frequency. Increase F, right? Of course, that means we're going to decrease lambda. The wavelength is going to get smaller, okay? So on this end of the spectrum, we're going to have very large frequency and very small wavelength, right? We just said it's an inverse, okay? So what are we going to do? We're going to take an electric charge. There's my electric charge, and I'm going to wiggle it. I'm going to wiggle it up and down, right? We're going to start wiggling it at a certain frequency, right? Remember, when we wiggle it, we get electromagnetic radiation. We get electric fields wiggling and magnetic fields wiggling, okay? If I wiggle it very slow, or not too fast, if I have a small frequency, the electromagnetic radiation that comes off, we call those radio waves. Okay? So 
because of radio waves. If now we take our electric charge and we wiggle it a little faster, we get something called a microwave. Microwave. So your microwave oven, what is it? It's a bunch of wiggling electric fields and a bunch of wiggling magnetic fields. If we take our electric charge and wiggle it faster, we get something known as infrared radiation. Okay, And infrared radiation is also known as heat. So when you feel heat, you're really feeling infrared radiation. What is infrared radiation? It's wiggling electric fields and wiggling magnetic fields. Okay, Now I'm going to leave a little gap here. Okay, I'll leave the gap. It's not that big, but I'm going to leave. Now, if we wiggle this charge even faster, we'll get back to that gap. Then we have what's called ultraviolet radiation. Right? The stuff that tans or kills skin and causes cancer. Right? If we wiggle it even faster, take this charge and wiggle it faster, we get something called x-rays. So when you go to the doctor or the dentist and you get an x-ray, what is an x-ray? An x-ray is a wiggling electric field and a wiggling magnetic field. And finally, if we wiggle everything as fast as we can wiggle it, we get something called gamma radiation. Gamma, the symbol is this, this funny looking thing. That's a gamma, gamma radiation. Okay. And there's the spectrum. Now, what do you think? Well, radio waves, right? If you turn on a radio in your house, radio waves are passing through you right now. So radio have, waves don't have much energy, but we know X-rays and gamma, they have a lot of energy. Notice it's large F. So we can deduce that for electromagnetic radiation, right? the energy of the wave and this is true about all waves, is proportional to the frequency, right? If you wiggle something faster, right? If you take a jump rope and wiggle it very slow, you put a little energy in. But if you wiggle it super fast, you put in a lot of energy. So the energy of a wave is proportional to the frequency, <clears throat> okay? Now, this gap is what we call visible light. This is the stuff our eyes can see. Okay, and that's broken up into the spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, what a beautiful color, indigo, and then violet. Okay, so again, as we go this way, the frequency is increasing. That means violet, color violet has more energy than red because red is on this end of the spectrum with lower, smaller frequencies, okay? So violet has more energy, okay? Now, what does this have to do with the lab? Well, what we want to do is we want to look at the spectrum of hydrogen. That's the whole idea, the spectrum of hydrogen. Okay, before I do that, going to do a silly analogy and please bear with me it's it's a very silly thing but uh hopefully it'll it'll explain a couple things okay so here's what we're going to do i'm going to say i want to build the staircase so forget hydrogen for now build a staircase okay now i'm a very bad builder. I can't build anything very well. Okay. So when I build the staircase, it turns out not only are my steps crooked, they're not even flat. Okay. But they're not even evenly spaced. Look at this. Look at these silly steps. What a silly, right? They're all too. Now, what I want to do is if I take a ball, say that's a ball, and we throw it up. And we, we give it all this energy. It goes up here, say. Well, that step is crooked, right? So what's going to happen is the ball is going to fall. Now, notice there's a rule. The ball can never, ever go between steps. Never between steps, right? It's a rule between steps. So when I throw the ball up, 
in a silly staircase. Well, whatever steps it hit, it starts making a pattern. If I close my eyes, I hear it go bloop, blop, bleep, bleep, bleep. Okay, bloop, blop, bleep, bleep, bleep. Say that's staircase A. Okay, now if somebody throws a ball up and it falls down and I my eyes are closed, and I hear bloop, bleep, blop, 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 or whatever I just said, then I know that's always staircase A. Now I'm going to build another staircase because I'm just... Now this one is different, okay? Okay, whatever. And I'll call that staircase B. Same thing. Ball cannot go between the steps, right? And so we take a ball and we're going to throw it all the way up here. And the ball now goes down, bloop, bloop, bling, blong, bloom, blah, whatever the pattern of sound. But whenever I hear that pattern of sound, pattern of sound, I know it's always staircase B. Or if it makes a different sound, I know it's always staircase A or staircase D or staircase F. Whatever staircase I built, I know by the pattern of the sound. Now, the pattern of the sound is really, it's not a spectrum, but it's its a pattern that tells me what's going on and what the energy levels or what the step levels are, okay? So we're going to do the same thing with hydrogen, okay? So hydrogen, we imagine, has energy levels, just like steps, okay? But those steps or those energy levels are not evenly spaced, just like my silly staircases, Okay. So this is my nucleus. Our nucleus has pluses and neutrons. We'll talk about that. So this is our nucleus. And so let's say we have the first step. And we're going to label, we're going to get N equal one. That's the lowest energy state. So a lot of times the lowest energy state we call the ground state. Okay, keep that in mind. Sometimes I ask that the ground state. The ground state is the lowest energy state. Now the next level, the next step maybe is here, N equal to two. Remember, they're not evenly spaced. They're like my silly staircase. Maybe here is n equal three. And maybe here is n equal four. And maybe there is n equal five. And maybe here, I don't know, somewhere over here, I don't care, n equal six and n equal seven. Okay, we don't have to do any more, okay? So we get the idea. So let's say, and there's a, not an infinite, but a lot of energy levels for hydrogen. Okay, now what are we going to do? Here's what we do in lab. So right here is an electron, okay? And it's a sad electron because it's all by itself. It's like, now what we're going to do is we're going to give it some energy. We're going to give it some electromagnetic radiation, okay? EM radiation, EM radiation. Now it turns out, and I know we said that EM radiation We'll learn about this in class. Behaves like a wave, no doubt. There's no doubt about it. It does all the wave properties, interferes. You could put it in lenses, whatever, okay? But it turns out it also behaves like a particle. Okay, now I'm going to put an exclamation mark and then a question mark. How could it be a wave and a particle? Okay, and this is going to be called the wave-particle duality. Wave-particle duality. That waves can behave like particles and particles can behave like waves. Wave particle duality. It all depends on how you measure it. Okay. It's like I always use the example when you have your child and your child acts like a brat and doesn't go to bed on time or eat its food. But when you give it with the babysitter, the child's an angel. Same child, but how you interact with it, one way it behaves like a brat and one way with someone else, it behaves like, like a, an angel, okay? Well, electromagnetic radiation is similar. Depending on how you measure it, sometimes it behaves like a wave, sometimes it behaves like a particle. And if you don't measure it, you can't say it's a wave or a particle. It just is, okay? Very Eastern philosophy. Now, a particle of electromagnetic radiation is called, you should know this, a photon. And photons have no mass and no electric charge, okay? Photons are just energy, packets of energy, packets 
of energy. Okay. Now here's the thing about a photon. So there's our photon. Dude, there's our photon. Okay. That's our photon. And it's going to come in and it wants to give its energy to this electron. Now photons are, whoa, everybody should meet somebody like a photon. A photon has unconditional love, unconditional energy. Either it gives all its energy or none of its energy. It can't give part of its energy. Photons give all their energy or part of their energy. Now suppose this photon comes in, hits this electron, says, baby, baby, I want to give you all my energy. The electron, if it gives its energy, I'm just going to make this up. If it would put the electron right here, well, the electron's not allowed to go, just like the ball's not allowed to go between the steps. The electron's not allowed to go in that place. So the electron says, excuse me, I'm sorry, you're a very nice photon, but you would put me in a place I'm not allowed to be, so I'm not going to let you touch me. So what happens is this photon then woo, goes out because it would put the electron in a place it doesn't want to be. And we would say this photon is transparent. Well, this system is transparent to this photon. Now, what do we want something to be transparent to? Well, suppose this is a window and it's made of glass, right? We know, we know sunlight gets right through the glass. Glass is silicon dioxide. Okay, so the what happens is the photons of light here want to interact with the electrons in silicon and oxygen, but the electrons in silicon and oxygen say, you know what? You would put me in a place I'm not allowed to be. That's why we make the glass. And so the visible light just passes through. So it would be transparent. Now we know that in the summer, especially in the summer, the window, the glass, gets hot or warm at least. How could it get hot? Well, it turns out the sun not only puts out visible, it's the visible gets through, visible, right? Roy G. Biv, the colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. But it also puts out, you know this, ultraviolet radiation. Now, the ultraviolet radiation, aha, what happens is, suppose this photon comes in, and now it hits this electron, but now it hits the electron, and it puts it, I'm going to put it, I don't know, all the way up here, okay? Suppose it puts the electron just enough energy to put it on step six. Remember our staircase. Now, remember my staircase was crooked, so the ball fell down the stairs. Well, this is not a hot energy state that, that's stable. So what happens is, the electron then falls down. Now, if it falls to this level, it gives off a photon of a certain color. If it drops to there, it loses energy and gives off another photon of another color, etc. And what happens is we get not a pattern of sound like we did with the stairs, now we get a pattern of colors. Now remember, my pattern of sound was unique to staircase A or unique to staircase B or unique to every staircase had their own pattern of sound. Well, the pattern of colors is like a fingerprint. And it identifies the element. So each element has its own pattern. So all hydrogens would have a certain pattern. So if I look at the spectrum of an element and I see a certain pattern, I say, ah, that's, that's hydrogen. If I see a different pattern, I say, ah, that must be oxygen. Just like if I hear a different pattern on my silly staircases, ah, that's staircase A. Or a different pattern, ah, that's staircase B. Here we get a pattern of colors. So every, every atom has its own pattern of colors, and that's called the spectrum, okay? It's called the spectrum for the element. That's how we can identify what elements are in the sun or in different stars, because each element has their own spectrum, okay? Now, hydrogen, there's going to be a lot of electrons going, let's say, from level eight down to level three, or level... 
12 down to level five or level seven down to level one. There's all these kind of, there's so, all different possibilities. But in hydrogen, it turns out only three transitions are visible, only three that we can see. The rest are all in the infrared or heat region of the spectrum, infrared, okay? So there's only three visible transitions in hydrogen. Okay, And those three transitions, I'll just tell you now, is level three to level two, level four to level two, and level five to level two. So if, again, if we think about these as steps, if something falls from step three to step two, it has the least energy. Step five to step two would be the most energy. Okay, so if we drew our picture with our nucleus and said this was level one, and let's say that's level two, and let's just draw a couple here, three. And again, they're not evenly spaced, n equal four, n equal five, n equal six. Not evenly spaced, I'm just running out of room, okay? The only transitions we can see is when it goes from three to two or when the electron falls from four to two or when the electron falls from level five to two. Those are the only three, okay? Now, a scientist a couple of hundred years ago by the name of Rydberg told us what these wavelengths will be. So this Rydberg formula allows us to calculate the wavelength, right? When the trip, when this comes out, you're going to get electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation, and they're all going to have different wavelengths, right? The Rydberg formula lets us calculate the wavelength. Calculate lambda for each transition, for each transition. So I'm going to show you the Rydberg formula, okay? So the Rydberg formula, lambda, from level M to level N. I'll show you exactly what this means. And the answer is going to be in nanometers, nanometers, right? Nanometers. Remember, that's 10 to the minus ninth of a meter. So it's really tiny wavelengths. Is this formula, 91 Point one five divided by 1 over n squared minus 1 over m squared. You say, what the heck? I don't understand m. I don't understand m. And I don't know what the heck you're doing. All right, let's look at the wavelength. And again, this is in nanometers, nanometers, okay? That stands for nanometers. Okay, so let's see. Let's. What would the formula look like for a transition from level 3 to level 2, okay? Well, that would equal 91.15 divided by, now we're going to level two. So we get one over two squared, that's one fourth, minus one over three squared, right? One fourth minus one ninth. It's a positive number. The wavelength must be a positive number. You cannot have negative lengths, okay? If I wanted the transition from four to two, right? Again, this is in nanometers. Okay, four to two, it would be 91.15 divided by one over two squared minus one over four squared. So one fourth minus 116. Again, the answer you get in your calculator would be in nanometers. And finally, if we wanted a transition from level five to level two, same formula, 91.15 divided by now one over two squared minus one over five squared. So one fourth minus one twenty fifth again in nanometers. Okay. So those are the three wavelengths we will calculate because we can only see three to two, four to two, five to two. Now on the test, suppose I said find the wavelength for the transition of eight to three. Okay. Well, lambda going from eight the three, it's very simple. What is it? It's 91.15 
divided by one over three squared minus one over eight squared. Okay, and again, that's nanometers. Okay, so it's very simple to use this formula, but you may have pro problems trying to plug it in. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're going to do with the radioactivity. We're going to measure the different wavelengths for different for the three transitions, five to two, four to two, and three to two, that we can actually see. That's the only part, three transitions that are in the visible part of the spectrum. The other transitions, say eight to three or seven to five or seven to three or whatever, is uh, they're all in the uh, infrared or heat part of the spectrum, and we cannot see them. Okie doke. All right. Well, let's talk about, let's finish this off. Let's talk about the second part of the lab, which has to do with radioactivity. Okay, radioactive, what radioactivity means, and this is a good definition that we can use on an exam or whatever, right? Just means you have an unstable nucleus. Okay, radioactivity, if, it's, if a nu nucleus is radioactive, means the nucleus is unstable for whatever reason. Remember, we're not doing nuclear physics here. We're just doing very basic stuff. Okay, so let's look at a nucleus for a second. Inside the nucleus, we don't know exactly what's going on, but there's two types of particles, these ends called neutrons and the protons, which have a positive charge, neutrons and neutrons. Okay, protons, protons and neutrons. Okay, so we have protons, which you know should have a plus charge and neutrons, which have no charge, zero charge. Okay, anything found in a nucleus, it's only two things, protons and neutrons, these are called nucleons, like saying boys and girls or whatever, and they make people, uh, whatever you wanna say, right? These are called nucleons. So anything found in the nucleus called nucleons, okay? I gotta... Okay, so anyway, there's two types of nucleons, protons and neutrons. Now, if we look carefully, it turns out, uh, and this is very small, the diameter of a nucleus is about 10 to the minus 15th of a meter. Okay, I'm not going into the whole thing on atoms, but it's very, very tiny. Now, if you remember, if you put a plus charge near a plus charge, they hate each other. Ah, I hate you. Really? I hate you. So what happens is these protons want to just push away. Oops. Okay, push away. And uh, all fly out. And the question is, why don't these protons fly away? Well, it turns out that inside the nucleus is the strongest force in the universe. Okay? And that's called the nuclear force. So the nuclear force wins out over the electric force, right? This is the electric force that wants to make them push away, electric force. But the nuclear force over battles against it, okay, and keeps things together. But you need neutrons because neutrons don't push apart. Neutrons kind of keep everybody together. Neutrons are, I call neutrons the nuclear glue because they really keep the nucleus. You need neutrons in there. If you can't have two protons, it won't work. Uh, nu nuclear glue. Okay, neutrons are like Gandhi; they love everybody. Okay, nuclear glue. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about two quick conservation laws. Remember what a conservation law is. Conservation law says what you start with is what you finish with. Conservation laws. Okay, one, uh, nucleon number. Nucleon number. 
In other words, if I start with 12 nucleons, no matter what happens in a reaction, I have to finish with 12 nucleons. If I start with seven nucleons, no matter what happens, I have to finish with seven nucleons, okay? And the second conservation law, what we start with is what we finish with, is electric charge. So if my system, electric charge, if my system, our system, has a total charge of plus 23, no matter what they do, no matter how they interact, the final charge must be plus 23. And if my system has a total charge of minus 17, then no matter what happens, the final charge must be minus 17. Okay? So let's look. What can happen? So we're going to talk about radioactivity. What happens in radioactivity? Well, here's one thing that can happen. Here's my nucleus. Okay? I'm going to take a neutron. It has no charge. Now, it turns out a neutron can change. The only thing it can change into is another nucleon. So it has to be a proton. But you see, a proton has a plus charge. You cannot start with zero charge and finish with plus charge. So what also is produced, but it's emitted, so it could hit the professor with the nose here, standing here. Oopsie, hit me upside, upside the nose. Oh! Okay, uh, this thing is called a negative beta. So we have N0, one nucleon, changes into another nucleon, but is a positive charge. But if we had add it with a negative, the total charge is zero. Minus plus one, if you want, minus one, total charge is zero. So that's good, okay? This is called negative beta decay because that's a negative particle, negative beta, so that's a beta decay, okay? It turns out that negative beta is just an electron. They didn't know that when they discovered it, so they called it a beta, but it's just an electron with a lot of energy. So a beta minus particle is an electron, a lot of energy. So this can come out of the nucleus, and this could be radioactivity that would hit you upside your head, okay? Negative beta decay. Notice that whenever negative beta decay ha happens, what you're doing is you add a proton to the nucleus. Okay. Now, we haven't mentioned it, but the identity of an element, identity of an element is determined by the number of protons. You must, must, must remember this. Not the number of neutrons, not the number of electrons. What makes the identity of an element is this. So if you have one proton, by definition, you're hydrogen. If you have two protons, by definition, you are in your nucleus, uh, then by definition, you're helium. If you have three protons in your nucleus, you're lithium. If you have 92 protons, then you're uranium, et cetera. Okay, so the number of protons identifies the element. So if we see here, if you add a proton to the nucleus, then the nucleus changes. So for example, if element X, and let's say it has, I'm going to put that down here. Let's say it has a, uh, 83 protons, okay? If it undergoes a negative beta part decay, then this must be element Y that has 84 protons. You see, 84 minus one has to be 83. So you get a new element. Nucleus changes to a new element. Okay, so element 83 becomes 80, element 84. Element 17 would become element 18. You add a proton in negative beta decay, okay? Well, let's look at another reaction we can have, okay? Well, here's my nucleus, our nucleus, and now suppose we take a proton, right? If it changes, the only thing it can change to is a neutron, but you can't start with a plus charge and end with neutral. So what happens is, comes off again, this we call a beta positive particle, okay? And again, that's going to hit me upside the nose. I say, oh, no, okay? So beta plus decay, right? Notice you lose 
a proton. So for example, element uh, X43, if it undergoes a positive beta decay, then it becomes element 42. You lose a proton, okay? Now beta plus is called a positive beta particle, positive beta particle. Okay, it's also called a positron. So keep that in mind. So a positron is a positive beta particle. It's also called an anti-electron. So a positron or positive beta particle is an anti-electron. So it's an example of antimatter. So antimatter does really exist. It's not just science fiction. Okay, so a nucleus can undergo, remember it's radioactive, means when it undergoes positive beta or negative beta, it's going to a lower energy state because it's losing energy, it's giving off a particle, okay? Sometimes the nucleus, that nuclear force, <coughs> excuse me, cannot keep the nucleus together. And sometimes, I say this, the nucleus gets too big and it wants to stay together, so it gives off, a, uh, emits a chunk, emits a chunk of gunk, chunk of gunk. Okay, so let me show you this. Okay, symbolically, okay? So here we go. So here's my nucleus, here's our nucleus, right? Now this chunk blah, 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 is gonna go flying off. And this chunk is always this, it's two protons and two neutrons. Okay, so this thing, has a charge of plus two, right? Because it's got two protons. And this thing is called an alpha particle, or this is alpha decay. Okay. Alpha, we'd write like this, two protons and four nucleons. That's the number of nucleons, right? Two protons and two neutrons is four. Number of nucleons. And this is the charge. Right? Beta plus was plus one charge, but it had no mass, no nucleons. Beta minus, we'd write like this, but it has no nucleons. Okay, so this is alpha. It turns out that this is the same. So an alpha particle, this is an alpha particle. Particle is the same as a helium. Four, because it's got four nucleons, nucleus. So these are synonyms. Okay? So when a nu nucleus gives off this big chunk, it gives off an alpha particle. So what you're doing is you lose two protons. Right? So for example, element X that has, uh, you know, 68, if it undergoes this, Alpha, two, four, plus, okay? And uh, I'm going to make this up. Suppose it's 120. And we'll do balancing later. Then this becomes Y, right? So this number plus this number on the bottom has to add up to this number on the bottom. So this must be 66, okay? And this number on top plus whatever is on top here must add up to this. So this has to be one, one, six. We'll do this later, so don't worry about it, okay? But notice you went from element 68 to element 66 because alpha decay, what happens is you lose two protons, okay? All right, finally, the last ty type of uh, nuclear uh, decay that we'll talk about is called gamma decay. Gamma decay. Okay, we write gamma like this. Now remember, gamma is just a photon. Remember, a photon has no charge. So I'm putting a zero there, has no charge. And it has no nucleon, so it's zero. So gamma decay does not change the number of, pro of, of protons. So the element stays the same. So what's going on in gamma decay? We think this is what's going on. 
Remember we had electron energy levels as my nucleus and there's the electron energy levels. And we said when the electron drops down to a lower energy level, it gives off a photon heat or visible and spectrum. Well, we believe inside the nucleus, inside the nucleus that there are energy levels. We can't look inside. And what happens is if one of the nucleons, a proton or a neutron, drops down to go to a lower energy state, to a, low, to a lower level, a photon is emit, emitted. Just like on the electric case, photon emitted. But now this photon is a gamma photon. Now remember, gamma has no charge and no nucleon. So if element X undergoes gamma decay, it still remains element X didn't change. Okay. So again, if this is a nucleus and a gamma particle comes off and this is my big nose and me, I go, oh no, it could hit me, right? This is the particle that's emitted. The gamma is emitted. Okay. But the nucleus stays the same. The element does not change. Now, in lab, we're going to measure the radiation rate, okay? In lab, now, we want to count the number of particles emitted. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Emitted. Okay, emitted. Okay. Now, our sample, our radioactive sample, is this. It's strontium. It's called strontium-90. That 90 means it's got 90 protons and neutrons combined. Okay, Down here is 38. So remember, this number down here, that's an 8. Sorry, 8. All right, that looks terrible. Okay, this is the number of protons. And this is the number of nucleons, not neutrons, number of nucleons, protons plus neutrons, right? So the number of, pro number of neutrons for strontium, right, would be 90 minus 38, which I guess would be 52. So it has 52 neutrons and 38 protons. Now this undergoes beta minus decay. Remember, we got to add up the top. So there's 90, there's zero. So the next element has a zero there. Now this is 38. So what number minus one is 38? So this is going to be 39. It's a new element. And it turns out this new element is called yttrium. Good thing we used the Y, yttrium. So strontium is being converted into yttrium. Okay. So if we have a strontium atom, there's a strontium atom, SR. What's coming out is a beta minus particle. And we want to count these, count the number of beta minus particles, beta minus particles. Okay. And the device we use to count the particles, device used to count particles, device used to count number of particles is called a Geiger tube. Okay. It's also called a Geiger counter. Either one is okay. Okay. Geiger counter. Okay. Now we're going to have our radioactive sample. So our sample, remember our sample is what? It's strontium-90. And it's going to be in a little pellet. Okay, so this is our strontium-90. Okay, And this pellet, this pellet has a French name. Isn't this cool? This pellet, they call it a planchette. Plancher, plancher, planchette. 
Okay. And that's going to be our radioactive sample of strontium 90. Remember, this is strontium 90. Strontium 90. That means we coming off we in all directions. We are these negative beta particles. And we want to try to count them. Okay. And we're going to use this device called the Geiger tube. Okay. Now essentially, this is the idea. We're going to put our, our sample here. Remember, the particles are coming off. The particles are coming off. The particles are coming off. And above here is our Geiger tube. Okay? And it's going to count. Right? The number of particles. Okay? There's two things we want to learn. Okay? Number one is that if you I'll call this D, the distance. If you increase the distance, increase the separation between your sample and the Geiger tube, increase the distance. Well, it's clear that the number of counts that your Geiger tube will measure should decrease. Right? So here, let's look over here. So here's my sample. If I put my Geiger counter here, woo, a lot of particles are hitting it, right? A lot of particles are hitting it. I get a very high count. But if I take my sample, put it here, and my counter way up here, then by the time the particles go all over the place and some get absorbed by the air, by the time they get up to there, the number of counts is much less. So as you increase this separation, this distance, the number of counts decreases, okay? decreases. Simple. The second thing has to do with shielding. Right? If I put something in the way, if I put a cover here of something, right, then again, the number of counts should decrease. Depending, number of counts should decrease. Depending on what I use, to shield the radioactive sample. If I put a piece of paper, then maybe that's not such a great blocker of the negative beta particles, right? If I put a piece of plastic, that may be better. And of course, it depends not only on what I'm shielding with, but also the thickness. The best thing to shield, of course, will be something thick like lead. That's why when you get an X-ray, they put that lead apron on you and lead then absorbs essentially everything. Right. So we're going to do the experiment. We put different shielding on it. And again, we take count. The, uh, we look at the number of counts. And of course, it should decrease depending on what we use. If we use lead or paper or plastic. They, it all decreases uh, different amounts. OK. And that's the whole idea behind the labs. Right. That these radioactive particles, uh, the count will decrease with distance separation from the uh, Geiger tube to the uh, sample, increased distance, the number count decreases and depending on the shielding, but with any shielding, it's the number of counts should decrease to some degree. Okay, I hope this stuff helps. Good luck and take care.